Okay, welcome back to a new series of targeted grazing online workshops for 2015. This is presented by a committee from the Society for Range Management. And you can see that we have many partners on the screen here. You can see some of the partners who have made this uh, workshop series available to us. Okay, so the Targeted Grazing Committee is a committee of the Society for Range Management. We're a group of practitioners, land managers, researchers, and extension specialists who are interested in targeted grazing. Um, our goal is to promote the development and continuing education of members for the stewardship of rangeland resources. That's the goal of the Society for Range Management. You can learn more about the Society at www.rangelands.org uh, for anyone who's interested in managing or conserving rangelands. And then you can find more out about our committee, the Targeted Grazing Committee, at our website, targetedgrazing.wordpress.com. I'll tell you more about that at the end of the webinar. Uh, so what things that we do in our committee, of course, we have these online workshop series. This new series, again, is called Targeted Grazing on the Ground. We have a previous one called Principles of Targeted Grazing. So if you want to get down to the basics, you can go to those posted online at our website. We're also working on a scientific paper on targeted grazing as a restoration tool. We're the ones that wrote the Wikipedia entry for targeted grazing. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, we also contribute. You can also contribute to our um, Targeted Grazing Instagram account, or you can just simply email us at targetedgrazing at gmail.com. Okay, so for those of you who are members of the Society for Range Management, you may be listening to this to get continuing education credits. You, if you go to our website and click under training, so targetedgrazing.wordpress.com, click training, you can fill out a sheet that um, shows that you participated in this workshop. You need to give us just a little bit of information about some of the some of what you learned in the workshop. Uh, this on the ground series that I mentioned is starting uh, today, October eighth, with Beth Reynolds, and it will continue. We'll have one presentation a month all the way through the month of February. So we're starting out with setting objectives for targeted grazing plans. Uh, then we will look at livestock and endangered species. We'll also look at livestock and wildlife interactions. Uh, in January, we will um, have a presentation on multi-species grazing and bring some people in to talk about that. And then um, at, in the very end in February, um, I will talk about communicating with in administrators and clients when you're developing targeted grazing projects. So I'm Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and I'm just sort of the webmaster for this project. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, that's Beth Reynolds. She works at uh, Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo, and she's been doing targeted grazing in a number of uh, ways in the past. And, tar and Beth, I'm going to pass this over to you. And uh, tell us more about yourself, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Beth Reynolds, and I'm going to be presenting today on uh, grazing for, for a specific objective. Um, this is the first module for our fall 2015 series. Um, my background is uh, I, I actually graduated from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 2005 and started my own uh, goat grazing company and um, I did that for about 11 years and had a lot of different jobs that I worked on and uh, gained a lot of good on the ground experience of implementing this kind of business and um, understanding the dynamic between animals, plants, and, and land. So um, I also had a minor in rangeland resources so I enjoy plant identification and working to improve native habitats. Um, I currently uh, sold my business and am and, uh, totally focused on teaching at Cal Poly. And I teach sheep and goat production and manage the unit here on campus, which also includes doing some targeted grazing on campus with a small herd of sheep and goats. So today we're going to be talking about grazing for a specific objective and um, I want to refer back to the targeted grazing definition that was outlined in the handbook um, that kind of outlines you know exactly what targeted grazing means and so it's the application of a specific kind of livestock at a determined season duration and intensity 
to accomplish defined vegetation or landscape goals. So today I'm going to focus on this latter part of the definition, defining vegetation or landscape goals, uh, which we're calling specific objectives. So um, due to the time that we have with these webinars, I've kind of outlined a few of the main reasons that we do targeted grazing projects. Um, one, one of the top reasons here in California would definitely be reducing fuel loads. Um, and secondly, I, I have uh, managing invasive plant species, improving wildlife habitat, uh, number four, maintaining riparian areas, and number five I have is sort of a catch-all, managing vegetation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these objectives. Oops, sorry, went too far there. Okay, so the first objective, uh, using targeted grazing to reduce fire fuel loads. Um, so this, this objective can be a wide range of projects from simply reducing fine fuels to uh, creating some very uh, drastic fire breaks um, around homes and, and whatnot. So I have a photo here of a project I did um, around some residential homes and uh, on the left is uh, where the goats have been and on the right is where they're going to go. But uh, the idea of the project was reducing fine fuels, which is the, the yellow grass there, the wild oats, um, and also limbing up the oak trees. So they stand on their hind legs and help uh, limb up the trees. So here are some examples. So as I mentioned, uh, reducing fine fuels. Um, here in California, we have a very standard rule of having a 100-foot uh, defensible space around all dwellings. So anything that would uh, definitely cause harm to a human or dwellings that um, you know are of importance or value. Um, some projects can also list very specific amount of re reduction in fine fuels. So you may do some residual dry matter sampling to estimate uh, before and after the project how much pounds per acre you actually removed. Um, removing ladder fuels is another important one. Uh, ladder fuels are uh, vegetation that leads from the surface of the soil up into a tree canopy or into the brush line. And so um, animals being used to reduce ladder fuels can help uh, keep a, a wildfire controlled and reduce the height of the flame um, and hopefully prevent it from reaching roof lines. Um, creating canopy gaps, so sometimes just taking an area that's really, really dense uh, breaking up the bushes and getting some paths in between them um, can reduce the intensity of the fire and help to control it. Uh, trampling brush, maintaining the height. So again, uh, just trying to minimize the, the intensity of a fire coming through. And then removing tree leaves. So I work with goats predominantly and they're very good at eating trees and, and climbing up on their back legs to reach um, high up, and so this is a benefit for reducing um, a fire hazard because uh, it's reducing fuel that is leading into the tree canopy um, and is beneficial for the fire department. So this objective is usually based on very specific uh, state or local fire department regulations. Um, here in California, we have a lot of regulations about fire safety, and depending on other states that you may be working in, um, they would be different. So, um, And then other aspects are homeowner's insurance. Um, depending on where your home is located, it can be very challenging to get approved for homeowner's insurance. Um, if you do not have defensible space around your home, or you live you know, at the top of a canyon, um, they can have very specific guidelines on what they expect you to do as a homeowner to minimize risk. Um, published guidelines, so some estimates of what an ideal residual dry matter amount might be. 
And then sometimes it's just personal opinion of the, the fire marshal or the land manager uh, taking an area and just um, assessing that it's reduced its fuel load. So these, this objective is typically applied, as I mentioned, around homes or dwellings, um, but uh, wider areas are typically these wildland urban interfaces. There's some very large projects out there that are done specifically to prevent a fire that's either coming from the wildlands into an urban area or leaving an urban area threatening the wildlands. So creating a buffer around um, the city is very helpful. Um, some areas may have combustible products. So I mentioned this really in working for like a, f a facility or some kind of corporation yard where they have flammable products and so they have to really be careful about um, maintaining the area around it. And then uh, strategic locations to stop the spread of a fire. So depending on you know where a city is located or a home, uh, the fire department can assess some areas that would be the most strategic to uh, control the vegetation to prevent the spread of a fire. So what does the livestock manager need to know in this objective? So there are several different things, um, and some of this stuff I will talk about more with um, other objectives. Uh, first, I would definitely say is identifying the targeted plant species that you're working with, uh, whether it's brush or fine fuels, um, making sure that you know about this plant, uh, you know any palatability issues, especially with brush. Sometimes there's some tannins or toxins that um, are not palatable to livestock later in the season. Um, and then supplementation, some of the plant species may not be very nutritious at times of the year, and so making sure that you are prepared for supplementation. Um, fire season, so be aware of your fire season in your area. That's the objective here is reducing it, so getting the project planned out and completed within the fire season. Uh, determining the appropriate livestock. Uh, so this is something that we spoke about in our winter webinars, um, is selecting the right livestock for the job. And so I start out by saying species, so whether it's a sheep, a goat, cattle, um, really choosing the right livestock for the targeted species that you're working with. Um, I also mentioned age and stage of production, weight. Um, so some of these projects, you know, have very poor quality feed, you know, um, so having lactating does and a bunch of brush is maybe not a good idea. Um, also age and weight, so some of these projects may require a heavy animal to trample the brush, to break down uh, woody material, and so having an animal that's heavier and capable of doing that could be advantageous. Um, horns. So in working with goats for several years, I've definitely observed goats use their horns very creatively to gain access to vegetation, um, you know, hooking branches with their horns and pulling them down. Um, and so if you have, you know, plants that really need to be broken down, um, the horns could be a good option for that. Um, and then previous exposure to the targeted plant species. So making sure that the animals you're using are familiar with these plants and that they have uh, been successful at eating them previously. And that's something we talked about earlier in our other webinars. So um, Some other things are looking at adjusting your stock density. There's a lot to be said about this, especially with this specific objective, using your stock density to create uh, the result that you're looking for. Um, so, you know, some of these projects can be very simple, open grasslands, just reducing the biomass, and other projects can be, you know, seven foot tall thicket of brush. And so, you know, using your stock density accordingly will help you improve your effectiveness. And then lastly is just be mindful of, you know, potential for undesired impacts. Uh, so using your stock density, using the right livestock, uh, the timing of the year, 
making sure that you're uh, keeping uh, tabs on the soil surface, water quality, any wildlife habitat that exists there, um, and sensitive animal or plant species. So just be, be knowledgeable and be aware. Uh, the second objective I'd like to talk about is using targeted grazing to manage invasive plant species. Um, so invasive plant species are basically any plants that are undesirable and are very prolific. And so our main plan for this objective is really grazing to prevent seed production, timing it in a way that you are preventing the amount of seed that is produced. Um, here I have a photo of some sheep and goats that are being used to clear Italian thistle that's pretty common here in California. Um, and you can see it's all flowering and some of it's starting to set seed and so um, we are trying to control it at a specific time so that it does not set seed, which we were successful in doing. So, so examples of this um, can be reducing buds flowers or mature seeds, so depending on the species and the plant you're targeting. Um, sometimes it's just defoliating or weakening the targeted plant, so reducing it by 70% or 50% uh, will weaken it and reduce the seed production. Um, using high stock density to encourage livestock to heavily graze mature plants, so again, you know, looking at the plant species you have, um, some of them may require multiple grazings throughout the year, and so if you can graze the mature plants, often that reduces the seed production and you follow up with some grazing, um, it can be very effective. And then um, grazing, you know, maybe before or at bolting stage, so um, some projects may say, you know, please start the job, you know, when 25% of the targeted species are in bolting stage. Um, so just really figuring out the timing can be important. So this objective is definitely based on the research regarding the species that are, are targeted. Um, knowing that for your area um, is important. And then uh, sometimes it's land manager's knowledge or your knowledge of the plants, working on projects before. Um, agency requirements or guidelines, there may be some regulations about when you can graze, when you have to stop grazing, um, and so uh, that would be outlined in, in some guidelines. And then experience of local professionals, so people that are uh, biologists, ecologists, natural resource managers that are out there um, on the site may have very specific guidelines of when they'd like to target the plant. This objective is applied basically anywhere that there's invasive plant species that are causing a problem. So most common is that it is threatening sensitive habitat, invasive plants that become too prolific. Um, reduce the amount of, of desirable plants, and so oftentimes they need to be controlled to the point that uh, native plants have a chance to get reestablished. So heavy infestation, sensitive habitat. Um, some areas can just be a seed bank. Uh, like that photo I started out with was uh, Italian thistle along a crop field, and so sometimes there are just eight areas that are um, problematic as being a seed bank. It's not so much the area that they're growing, but um, if the seeds spread, that, that would be a problem. So um, sometimes invasive plants can actually limit access to an area. Um, this photo here on this slide is uh, invasive. We have here in the county of San Luis Obispo called Cape Ivy. And as you can see, it just sort of drapes itself over anything. and so. It literally makes it areas inaccessible, and so sometimes just clearing it uh, improves the access. And then in dealing with the public, sometimes um, it's simply a nuisance. They can't weed whack it, the stumps are too thick, um, they don't like the seeds, or you know maybe they're not very knowledgeable that it's even invasive, but it's a nuisance. So there's a lot of reasons that this would get applied. So in using this objective in targeted grazing, um, you know, starting out with identifying the targeted plant species, 
and you need to understand the plant's life cycle. So uh, looking at you know how you can prevent and uh, hopefully control the seed production is your best um, advantage. And then knowing when it's most effectively grazed. So some of this will depend on the livestock species that you're using. Um, certain plants, you know, like yellow star thistle, may be only desirable to cattle or sheep at a certain stage, uh, where goats tend to eat it later into the season. So working with the livestock that you have, you should be knowledgeable about when that plant will most be effectively grazed. Um, and then just palatability, making sure there's no issues with um, uh, toxins that might prevent the animal from eating it. And then just retouching on, you know, making sure you're choosing the right livestock, so the right species for the targeted plant, um, the age, stage of production, uh, weight, and then horns can be a plus or minus. Um, I also bring up wool, or I should have said mohair as well if you're dealing with a, with a hair sheep, but, um, uh, or cashmere goats. So anything that's going to prevent or, or cause the seeds to get um, stuck on the animal and potentially take it to another location is sometimes of a concern. If it's a really invasive plant, that would be something to think about. Um, and then making sure that the animals have had previous exposure to the targeted plants um, would be a, a benefit. Determine if supplement, supplementation is required, so depending on the time of the year that you're grazing it and um, stage of production, be aware of any supplementation that might be required. Um, you can also look at stock density again, looking at how to adjust that and even the pasture size to inhibit invasive plant species and favor the desirable plants. So most people doing this are using you know, electric netting or, or poly wire, and so it's very easy to you know, not do a straight line. You can adapt your fence line so that you're targeting the invasives and, and um, keeping the desirable plants around. Um, and then again, just be mindful of your impacts on the soils, uh, desirable plants, and the ecosystem. Any um, sensitive species or you know, plants or animals that might be present. The third objective um, I'd like to talk about is using targeted grazing to improve wildlife habitat. Uh, there's been a lot of studies over the years about how grazing can be um, beneficial to wildlife habitat, so um, we're going to take a look at that. Um, so usually the objective here is reducing non-native plants um, so that native plants, which are more desirable to the native wildlife, is uh, have a chance. So um, you can, depending on your situation, use stock density to create access. Um, open a canopy area, so some of these areas are really overgrown and the, the floor may be um, completely shaded out, and so using stock density to really open up the canopy um, can improve grasses and forbs germination rates. Um, the other aspect may be just you know stimulating regrowth with a higher nutritional value. Um, so these are just kind of examples of what you know, um, people may ask you to do in a project like this. Um, so this is definitely, again, based on research regarding the livestock species that are present, the habitat that they require, as well as um, the types of plants that they require. So um, it's definitely based on the wildlife species that are there or desirable um, and the habitat that's required to sustain them. So this draws on expertise from wildlife professionals like biologists, ecologists, botanists, game managers, um, natural resource specialists. Um, it can also be people that have been on the land for a long time, resource or land managers that have experience with the area and they're knowledgeable about um, plants or wildlife that exist and what they need to exist. So this objective is usually applied where there's sensitive habitat. So you have wildlife that is being threatened, 
um, their habitat is being threatened or, or has deteriorated. So um, you're using targeted grazing to improve that site. Um, a lot of times, sensitive habitat also includes riparian areas, which are very critical for many species. Um, so a lot of projects are done in riparian areas. Um, other sites are where invasive plant species have become prevalent. And as we mentioned before, these invasives can compete with desirable plants. Um, and so sometimes targeted grazing to improve that site will help the wildlife. Um, and then some are sites that have just been disturbed. So areas where construction has gone on or um, a natural disaster has happened um, and the area could use some assistance in coming back, um, targeted grazing can help to improve that. So here's some things for a livestock manager to, to think about. Um, again, knowing the targeted species and specifically the habitat, so not just the plants, but how the plants intermingle or how dense it is or sparse it is um, in addition to the plants themselves. And then I just mentioned here that if you're dealing with invasive plant species, uh, refer back to objective two to understand that a little better. Um, determining appropriate livestock, so I'm not gonna go over all this again, but just making sure you have the right species for the project. Um, one thing I added in here was uh, diseases and parasites, so depending on the livestock and the wildlife that you're using, there are diseases, parasites that are transmittable from domestic livestock to wildlife and can pose a pretty substantial threat to them. So um, it should be something that you're aware of as well as oftentimes the project manager or um, client will um, you know, discuss this as an issue that potentially the livestock you're using could pose a threat to the wildlife. Um, and then previous exposure, we talked about before. So um, looking at, you know, how you build your pastures and set up your, your stock density so that you're focusing your grazing on undesirable species and favoring those that are desirable. So be creative with your electric fence. You don't have to fence the whole area, but you can, you know, uh, weave through areas and leave out some really desirable plants that you want to just leave alone. Um, use of a dog, a guard dog, may be precluded. So um, areas where you have invade, um, sensitive wildlife, like maybe a fox or frogs or um, rodents, uh, using a guard dog may not be the best thing for that animal, so that might be something to look at, be aware of. And then again, you know, balance what your objectives are with the ecosystem sensitivity, looking at water quality, um, preventing erosion, and protecting those desirable plants. Um, a fourth objective is ma maintaining riparian areas. Um, I have a bit of experience in doing this because we have a, a fairly large creek that comes through San Luis Obispo um, and is a huge watershed for most of the county. And so at certain times of a storm, these channels get flooded. And so the city, the county um, has paid me in the past to come in and basically maintain the channel so that the water flows effectively at these points. Um, so this is my creative fencing going through the creek. Um, so examples of these projects uh, can just be, you know, clearing undesired, undesired vegetation that's blocking or encroaching into a dry water channel, uh, which is like floodplain, uh, reducing biomass in a floodplain, um, and the idea there is this, you know, the more that you're removing, the more water that can take up that space and, and hopefully not flood into neighboring businesses. Um, improve visibility and access to uncover homeless camps and for tree crews to remove down trees and branches. Um, so we have uh, about 7,000 
homeless people in the city of San Luis Obispo. And so um, that is a problem for our riparian areas because of, well, they're not supposed to be there as part of it, but a big part of it is contamination. Um, sometimes their camps are not the most cleanly sites, and so they pose a threat to our water quality, our fish habitat, and so um, the county is really on top of maintaining these homeless sites and making sure that they're staying out of the riparian areas. Um, also, tree crews, so, you know, it's hard for a tree crew to go in and cut trees and stuff sometimes, so having the animals clear an area will help improve their visibility so that they can you know, find the trees that have fallen or the branches that are breaking um, and not be, you know, trying to crawl through a jungle to get their job done. So um, the project also sometimes, depending on where you live, might have some regulations. Um, here I'm familiar with the bird nesting season. Um, so we have to start after bird nesting season is completed and before winter rain. So there's a three month period there where we're allowed to be in the creek doing these projects. Um, and then, you know, some might be to reduce invasive plant species simply because the seed will get spread downstream and that of course is a problem. So, so this objective is based on uh, the research and knowledge of what the riparian area should look like and function. So specific to your area, what type of plants and uh, layout should you expect, um, and balancing that with, um, you know, allowing stormwater levels to pass, um, and then also accounting for wildlife and aquatic life habitat that um, benefits from that riparian area. So um, expertise of riparian specialists is what this is based on, uh, watershed ecologists, hydrologists, conservationists, biologist, ecologist, botanist, uh, natural resource manager, or, you know, the land manager. And I, and I say land manager in all of these because, you know, not every place has uh, somebody, you know, with a PhD to understand how to effectively manage an area. And so sometimes it's just, um, you know, a rancher that has been there and, and is knowledgeable. So this is applied in riparian areas, which include uh, creeks, rivers, floodplains, reservoirs, lakes, uh, and also man-made channels. So um, invasive plant species in riparian areas is a, is a big problem, as I mentioned before, just because uh, the, the seeds that are produced can easily spread downstream. Um, Lower watersheds uh, that undergo heavy stream flow during storms is also a, a good use of where to apply these objectives. Um, and then riparian areas that provide habitat to sensitive species. So helping to maintain that riparian cor corridor and uh, maintain the habitat and uh, plant species that are desirable. So here's some things for the livestock manager to know. Um, you know, understanding what your desirable riparian area is for that site. So making sure that you're knowledgeable, that people you're working with are knowledgeable about what the site should look like, um, and then asking yourself, how can targeted grazing contribute to producing that? Um, you need to identify any sensitive species, um, especially in riparian areas, there's quite a concentration of sensitive species, so plants, animals, fish. Um, identify any timing that uh, may occur in riparian areas, so birding, bird season or you know, rains or maybe uh, spawning, when fish are spawning. Um, if you're dealing with invasive species, look at objective two to um, understand some things to think about with that. And then, you know, just to go over this again, determining the right livestock, um, cattle, sheep, and goats are all very effective. And uh, looking at the targeted species that you have, making sure that you have the right livestock for that. Um, 
And then to prevent anybody from getting into trouble, you should make sure whether or not you need a permit for uh, doing work in riparian areas um, and what the rules are about that. Some um, you need to get a permit for. Some may regulate uh, the type of machinery that can be used. Um, sometimes you know you have to have um, a certain weed whacker or chainsaw that's approved for working in, in uh, riparian areas. So things to think about. And then adjusting your stock density, building pastures so that you're focused in areas that you're targeting and, and uh, leaving the areas that are desirable alone and balancing this objective with the terrain and ecosystem sensitivity. And then the last objective I have here is, you know, my catch-all miscellaneous, uh, simply managing vegetation. So here's a great example of my goats on a golf course that uh, the grass was too hard to mow and too fine to weed whack, and they had a huge infestation of rodents that were living, voles uh, that were living in the grass and running into people's houses. So they thought the goats would be a good option to reduce the biomass and uh, reduce the habitat for the rodents. So ex examples can just be, you know, creating access, improving appearances, um, increasing visibility. So I've done some projects on uh, dam surfaces to improve rodent activity um, monitoring and also just, you know, maintaining the site, being uh, able to visibly see, you know, the, the dam surface, um, reducing ornamental grass, so this is what I just talked about, and then, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons out there that people manage vegetation. Uh, I did another project around a golf course uh, simply so that golfers can find their balls easier. Um, and then, here on campus, um, our, our uh, chief of police was concerned about safety here on campus for students, that there we have a lot of oak trees and oak woodlands in the middle of campus that uh, they were concerned that they did not have a good line of sight through the trees, and so the goats have been used to clear those areas up and make it more visible. So this objective is really based on the land manager's desire or responsibility to keep an area clear or maintain, you know, the vegetation to prevent overgrowth. Um, so this can be, you know, the people you're working for, city officials, county officials, state officials, um, maybe a homeowners association, uh, police officers, land managers, or an owner. Um, so lots of residential homes would would apply this objective. Um, so this is you know, applied in a variety of areas to maintain access, uh, to make an area maybe more aesthetically pleasing, just cleaning, cleaning things up, um, improving line of sight, reducing habitat for unwanted species such as rodents or snakes. Um, and so really anywhere that um, these other objectives don't really apply. So this is a, a photo of goats at a water treatment facility. They need to maintain the facility, um, and it's either goats or weed whackers. So, so the livestock manager needs to be uh, aware of what the desired outcome is um, and how targeted grazing can contribute to that. I mentioned here that um, it's important to distinguish reasonable expectations of outcomes from unreasonable ones and make sure that you can communicate that to the client. In this objective, you often get people that are not always that knowledgeable about land management and so you need to make sure that the um, outcome that they're looking for is something that your animals can reasonably do and also maintain you know, good livestock management as well as good land stewardship. Um, so, you know, if somebody tells you to nuke it, take it down to the dirt, <laughs> maybe maybe that's a conversation you need to have with them, that that's not desirable in some in most cases. Um, so, and then identify plant species, look at any palatability issues, um, you know, picking the right livestock for the outcome that you're trying to produce, 
um, invasive plants, uh, refer to objective two. And then, um, you know, just to mention again, this is often from people that are not very knowledgeable. They simply want the plants to go away. And so you just need to make sure that you're um, doing these projects and being mindful of, you know, the terrain and the ecosystem sensitivity. Okay, so that's my overview of, you know, basic objectives for, for doing targeted grazing, um, just some examples of what people may outline uh, depending on who you're working for or, or where you're doing these projects. Some can be very specific. So um, with this webinar series, we're going to be um, incorporating more practitioners who are out there doing the work and um, hear from their experience. And so um, today I have Ray Holes that's going to uh, talk with us for a few minutes. And he has a company called Prescriptive Livestock Services. And um, he does grazing from the Canadian border down to toward uh, Mexico. And so he's dealt with a lot of different types of projects. And um, Karen, I'm going to pass this over to you and then um, Ray, if you can tell us a bit more about your company. You bet. I'm ready. And then I have some information about Ray on the screen here whenever I get the, uh, um, the whenever you pass it over. Okay, I'll accept. And then I'll bring Ray. Ray, I hope you're um, holding on. And here we go. Uh, okay. So I'm going to bring uh, Ray Holes in on the discussion then. Uh, and um, Ray, so tell us a little bit about your operation. We started out as a whatever cattle outfit in Idaho, and we're also on the weed board there. We work with different livestock species, mostly cattle and sheep, um, to manage weeds and to incorporate seeds in the ground, things like that, in the 80s. And uh, goats were mentioned as a tool at that time, but uh, very few goats were in our area at all. And uh, so the access to them was kind of limited, and we started doing some research and actually we were able to pick up a set of goats and bring them onto the ranch and it worked out well and it ended up growing into a pretty good sized business that we've been well, full time at for about 17 years now. Okay, so uh, looking at these objectives that I talked about today, is there are there any in particular that stand out as the most prominent to you? Well, I, I did the soils um, got my eye because that's something and when you get down we've got quite a bit of experience in California and it can be, you know, above average precipitation one year and below average the next ten. So it's kind of a tough place to plan. So you set up a if you're setting up a project down there you have to kinda of be able to, you know, be flexible in, in your stock density and timing and things like that to make some of these projects come off well. Um, okay. And one of the things I think that you mentioned is, you know, they if you if you if you have more than one project, um, you know, your timing and they said two weeks early this year is two weeks late the next is um, getting there at the right time to uh, actually managing it and, and having people understand it. Um, that you know, the clients that that you have to you have to plan you know, plan ahead, but you also have to make it some adjustments because of the seasons of growth and the volume and things like that. Right. Yeah, those are definitely big challenges. Is <clears throat> being at the right place at the right time and balancing other things, other projects you might have going on. Um, specific with these with objectives that I spoke about, um, have you worked on projects where you know there's very precise measures um, that they would like to be achieved? Oh yes, um, you know, especially in your fuel loads, you'll you'll find you know, real to the pound, you know, you know, three hundred, five hundred pounds per acre in residual, and of course that depends on what your spring rains or it might be, uh, what your residual is. You might leave in good shape and be um, on a certain amount of regrowth, but have more or sometimes less depending on what happens. Mm -hmm. Having people understand, like you mentioned, that. It's uh, and people that you can work with, I guess, in that understanding that yeah, it can it can grow back, and um, with your schedule to 
be someplace else and can't return to do that second pass, um, then, then they, you have to be able to make some adjustments. It, it's, it's the simple, simple part is what the animals do <laughs> in some ways. That's the, the management of the um, timing and your, your labor and, and access to different places and being there is, you know, it's around the weather and the growing patterns. And um, so, you know, having that, being able to be flexible and, and being able to adjust to that and communicating well is a big factor in meeting those objectives. And so in, in, in a project like the, the fuel reduction, um, do they follow up? With the monitoring and measuring and verify that you're you've completed the contract, or are you responsible for sh for showing that? You know, it depends on the the, uh, the client, but a lot of them are set up with somebody that comes in and actually does the monitoring and the measurements and the follow up that you work with closely through the, the program. Um, it's important, I think, that everybody understands that they're setting up a new project to make sure that there is one person, not multiple people, to do that from my standpoint because everybody has their own opinion of what, you know, yeah. how they, they measure things. And sometimes, like you said, it's different people. It's just a, it's an eyeball thing. You say, oh, it looks pretty good, and you go on with it. Other places, they actually weigh and measure, and, you know, it's, it's quite, quite a bit more precise. Um, Having that person that you're working with being consistent with that same person makes a big difference on how things work. And because in the multiple year projects, then that person, then their their costs go down because they don't have to come back. Everybody understands what your, your goals are, and, and a lot of times by the second or third or multiple seasons, some of these projects go on for years that you're coming and maintaining a fuel break. And you can save a lot of money by being aware and, and there, they know that you're going to get the job done correctly. And, and um, can you can you recap where where you've done work? Um, we've done projects for Forest Service uh, down on the right against the Mexican border, up as far as right up against the Canadian border. We've not ever tried to go into Canada, um, Washington State, and and uh, Montana. We're in five western states this year: Idaho, Oregon, Washington. California and Montana, and uh, we kind of move along. We don't try to be everywhere at the same time, but we try to move into different zones in the winter, early spring. We're in California, and then we start moving those animals north, and they work into projects in the northwest um, throughout the rest of the season, and uh, just finishing up our last of our wheat projects and nap wheat projects in Montana right now. And, uh, into our breeding season, we have a spring kidding program up here. Okay. So, what kind of weeds uh, do you usually work with? The invasive plants. Um, they, California has been almost always, uh, you know, fuel loads, and with weeds as a subtitle, you know, yeah. the weeds are there, so they're they're kind of addressed if, if you're there, but it's mostly about fuel loads. Um, mm -hmm. In some cases, brush, um, just brush species, but not necessarily for fuel loads, but for management of brush species. Then the Northwest, predominantly um, big weeds that we um, are on the radar for volume that the those projects work on. Napweed, um, different types of napweed, uh, leafy spurge, yellow star thistle, the Dalmatian toad flax the last um, three mm -hmm. years is come in pretty heavily in a lot of places, and, and those mm -hmm. probably are the big ones. Salt cedar and things like that is also being a, a, a bigger project every year for us on, on um, access points and rivers and red bearing areas. And so the livestock that you use are, are uh, goats and cattle or sheep? Mostly goats. Um, in, in the springtime in the California, we use quite a few sheep. And Northwest, we haven't run into too many projects where the sheep were. Um, we have, there's a lot of there's a lot of outfits up here with sheep, and um, so if it's a sheep project, we don't generally try to bid against them. Um, in most of our projects are goat projects, and I guess one of the reasons we have the goats, you know, there's is if you work with them quite a bit, for us it's just easier to find the projects if you're looking at it from a business standpoint. Um, mm -hmm. There's fewer people, fewer numbers of goats out there, um, and we've found that sometimes in, well, let's say, for instance, Montana, a project.
Okay, uh, Ray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off there so we can um, uh, finish up this webinar and get people on their way. Um, Beth, thanks for the, the great questions. It really is good to hear people who have on-the-ground experience. Um, again, we hope to continue these um, targeted grazing on the, line, on the ground ex um, topics. If you have questions for Ray or for Beth or for others, you can go to our targeted grazing website and, and just send um, just just send a question through the website, and we'll try to make sure that that gets to, to Ray and Beth and others. But um, thanks again, Ray, for joining us today. And Beth, thanks for kicking this new series off, the, the targeted grazing webinar series called On the Ground. And uh, Beth, do you have any parting comments? Otherwise, I think we'll let this group go. So anything from your side, Beth? No, I think we're good. Great. Well, thanks so very much, and um, hope that you'll join us online. Yeah. Thank you.